Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Enterprise Sales Development Podcast, brought to you by Science Technologies. We interview outbound leaders at fast growth businesses to learn their secrets and bring you actionable insights. Thanks for joining us this week. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Wanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode is with, great name, by the way, Johnny Salambini, who is currently the head of business development at Connects One and has a, a pretty nice uh, resume heading up sales development teams. Prior to that, he was at um, Observe.ai and former or previous to that, he was manager of enterprise sales development at Nice. So a number of movers and shakers in the call center space. And boy, Johnny has got some great Rounding. He's going to tell you how he went from being a, frankly, a, a really struggling SDR in his first six months on the job, um, had a really good mentor, and started to apply some really meaningful frameworks. And now here he is, um, very accomplished, has uh, exceeded quota and driven teams, uh, large teams, I might add, to really, really resounding success. And so He's going to share some of his kind of like hard won insights, if you will, and some of the frameworks that made him successful and that he learned along the way. So great episode to listen to, especially for other um, sales development managers or and or leadership around, you know, Johnny's kind of foundational concepts, some of the things that he's learned, some of the things he's put into practice and is now winning with. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Our conversation with Johnny. Salambini. And we're back with Johnny Salambini, which I think I nailed that uh, pronunciation this time around. Right and, on. And from a family of many Johns, um, Johnny, <laughs> you, you strike me as someone with a significant amount of leadership experience in the sales development space in a very short amount of time. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got into sales development and what led to those opportunities. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I started as a as a, an initial sales developer for a really small company here in Utah. Um, and they actually called the sales developers associate sales executives. Oh, interesting. And, uh, but it was very much sales development, you know, scheduling demos for my account executive counterparts. And um, after a little while, I, you know, got uh, my foot in the door at Nice and Contact. and they had an incredible framework, um, sales development leadership across the board, just amazing people. Um, and, and I credit all of my success to those individuals and, um, yeah, really they, they set me up for success, but, uh, it wasn't always uh, sunshine and rainbows. Um, <laughs> Is it ever? most people, no, never, never. Um, but you know, it, uh, to be totally transparent, um, I I struggled as a sales developer. Um, I did not do well. Um, I wasn't a top performer at all times. Um, and so my first six months at, at Nice and Contact were were pretty rough. And um, it was a bummer because I went in, you know, with high hopes. I wanted to be an account executive one day, and um, and I'm going to get there as soon as possible you know, just, you know, your typical sales developer approach. And that obviously wasn't going to happen with my track record over those first six months. And, and ultimately it got to a point where, you know, I was a little concerned for, you know, my job security and I wasn't happy with how well I was doing. And uh, that's when I approached my direct manager at the time. I kind of just told him that like, Hey, I'm, I'm worried about how long I'm going to last here with this, uh, this track record. And a uh, great leader, um, Ed, Ed is his name. Um, so shout out to Ed Richardson. He kind of just took a step back and we just started from scratch. Okay, what are we doing on a daily basis? Um, uh, where can we make improvements? And it was almost like I knew all of the things, but I wasn't doing all of the things consistently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's clear as day, but like, as a sales developer at the time, I was just showing up, get the work done and go home. And, you know, for a lot of salespeople, if that's your approach, 
that might be the reason you're struggling um, if, yeah. if you're anything like me. And so, um, uh, you know, I immediately put the, what he suggested into practice. I had to increase my pipeline. I had, uh, you know, increase the effort when it came to finding and sourcing my own leads. And, you know, that very next month I hit my first quota. It was super exciting. And then a couple months later, uh, COVID happened. So we, everybody was sent home. And for me, I know this isn't the case for everybody, but um, for me, it was like a blessing. Um, it allowed me to kind of take a step back and really focus on me, my process, my mindset. Um, and that was the turning point, I think. Um, I really dove into books and learning and personal development and uh, adjusting my mindset from like getting the job done to how can I be more intentional with each process? Yeah. And, um, uh, and just like this, this attitude of optimism, you know, and, uh, it's so I did very well. isn't it? it is, it is. And, and, uh, it follows you and, um, just like negativity though, it, it it's infectious, you know? And yeah. so if you ask anybody that's ever been on my teams, um, optimism, positivity is, is a non-negotiable for me, you know, and those that are negative, um, and spread negativity probably won't last very long on my team just because, you know, it's a, it's a cancer and, uh, affects the team around them. So, so yeah, I kind of hit that, uh, got on that train and just, I, I quickly just found my stride and I found this like passion for, helping people around me um because then i was quickly getting people coming to me like saying like hey what are you doing that is making this possible like how are right. you doing it so consistently month over month quarter over quarter and and then it was like when i was teaching them what i was doing and they started to adopt those things and there was like the same thing you know immediate impact and improvement that i was seeing from a distance it was like this like pure joy of just like, this is awesome. That is like the best feeling to know I imp I impacted them and, and not in a, like a selfish way. Like I'm not giving myself credit because at the end of the day, you know, they, they had to take action. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, that's when I realized that I loved, you know, coaching and, and helping the people around me. And even at that time though, like I didn't know that leadership was, going to be an option at the time. Um, the people around me had been leading for a long time and been with the company for a long time. I didn't see them going anywhere, but fortunately the, the company and the sales development organization started growing and, uh, that opened the door for me ultimately. And, uh, I'll just say it was a whirlwind. It was crazy. You kind of just get thrown into it and you've got this huge team and you're making sure everybody's taken care of. And, uh, sometimes you can get lost, but, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, the opportunity of, of being a leader. And uh, yes, it's, you know, I've done a lot in a short period of time and, and to be totally honest, you know, I, I don't recommend this to everybody and I'm not saying I'm special, but take your time. Don't rush into leadership or rush into an account executive, perfect your craft and um, go to your leaders and understand like, what does your day to day look like? What does leading look like? Um, what are the, the, you know, the awesome things, the good things, and what are the tough things you have to deal with and, uh, and yeah, perfect your craft so that you can relay and, uh, share that knowledge with your direct reports when you are leaders eventually. Um, but yeah, I've kind of got, uh, I've thrown myself into a few different leadership positions in a short period of time. And, uh. Um, but because of it, I've learned so, so much from, from those around me. That's great to hear. And, um, you know, you had your first kind of, and I love your title back then, manager enterprise sales development. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In the title. Um, yeah. There you go. <laughs> at nice. You'd mentioned, you know, you, you oversaw a team there. I'd love to double uh, back on something you said sure. around kind of like being intentional with each process and, and you started coaching towards consistency. Tell me what the elements were or are for you that sure. you believe are non-negotiables in that kind of coaching to consistency type of setup. Yeah. 
you know, it starts with, with how do you structure your day? Uh, right. Because if, if you aren't following the same process or, or at least close to it on a daily basis, your performance is not going to be consistent either. Right. So, um, it started with me developing my, my personal pipeline of prospects and leads and, um, doing that every single day, you know, who am I sourcing? Um, why is their title relevant to what I'm talking about? And, uh, um, rather than just like throwing everybody and anybody in, you know, and just hoping for the best, you know? Right. And so I think it started there. And then, um, and that was one of the things I struggled with that, that Ed pointed me to is like, Hey, this, we've got to, we've got to increase our output here. Like this is a major problem. And so once I started doing that and and leveraging tools like sales navigator, zoom info, um, uh, I had like a dedicated time of the day where I was like, so like immersed into milling for my leads. And, um, it was all about like, again, like that term intention. Um, I'm not going to call somebody or put somebody in my pipeline that, I don't know or have a, a very good reason to call them, right? Or I know for a fact this guy is who I want to talk to at this company. Mm-hmm. They're going to be either a decision maker or they can get me in touch with the right people. And at the very least, we can have a, a, a quality conversation. Um, and in my industry, we can have a quality conversation about call centers. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, um, you know, it started there and uh, and then it was perfecting or, or developing my pitch because for those six months or so, um, and maybe even eight, I guess at that point was, I was trying to adopt everybody's pitch around me. I hear mm. one thing and I want to try that. And I hear, you know, this top performer is doing this. So I have to do that. You know, it's just going to work. And, uh, it doesn't work that way is what I found. You know, you can adopt pieces of it, but what I always tell my team is if, how you uh, deliver your pitch is not how you naturally speak to an individual of any kind, whether it's a friend, family member, a uh, colleague, it's not how you talk to anybody. It's probably going to fall flat because that prospect is probably going to pick up on that. Yeah. They're going to recognize like, okay, they're either reading something um, or that just like wasn't a genuine uh, interaction. And so I, I don't, I can, I think the best way to describe it is like one day it just clicked. I delivered this pitch and it wasn't anything special. And it was at a time where like you could throw out your pitch, ask for a meeting and people either said yes or no. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Where now you've got to, you know, deliver value and, and why you're calling them and, and uh, be much more specific. And, and so then I, I found this flow of like, okay, that just rolled right off the tongue. And, um, I can keep using that and I can tell them why, why them, why their company, um, and why I'm calling now. And, uh, that way, why now, why care? Exactly. Exactly. And so, um, so it was totally relevant. It didn't sound like I was, I was playing this guessing game with a prospect on the other line. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then I just, every single day I knew exactly what I wanted to do at any given time. And, and my wife could even tell you, like, I was so dialed in to my process that, and we were working from home and she was actually in the middle of her master's program. So she was at home too. And she'd walk in and she's like, are you making calls right now? And eventually she just knew like, okay, he's going to stop at this time. So that's my time to interrupt him. And, uh, (laughs) and so I was very, I was just dialed into my process so once you find that and you understand like, okay, what are the, the tasks that I have to complete on a daily basis so that I'm setting myself up for consistency from a performance perspective? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I can hear it coming, coming through loud and clear too. You having done that for yourself is probably the, the, the number one coaching point of helping everyone of your current SDRs kind of hit that same light bulb moment, that yeah. same sort of like, Oh, I understand. I'm in command of why me, why now, why care? Exactly. For everyone you reach out to. 100%. Yep. Yep. I also think that that's probably key to developing the right messaging for unpacking a story. And, you know, no one, 
yours truly on the buy side for a long, 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 long time, you know, no one picks up the phone hoping to hear a pitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Even myself, the guy that's still making phone calls today. But, but, um, CMOs and, you know, <clears throat> people like me always are on the lookout for ways to do things better. Of course. Solve our own problems, get ahead, see around corners. You know, I always like to say amb- execs are an ambitious lot. They didn't get to where they are in an org chart by falling down. <laughs> no, that's right. You're exactly climbing right. up. <laughs> and so I'd love to kind of like get your perspective on, you know, you, you isolated that the most important or one of the most important parts of any process is the who and that choice of who. And I'd love for you to kind of like peel that onion a little bit further for the audience, sure. thinking about ways that you're leveraging tools ways that you're making decisions in, in, you know, a tightly defined industry or a a more defined industry like call centers as a, for instance, Um, give me your perspective on, on getting to the right who. Yeah. So, you know, the beauty of sales navigator is all of that information, regardless of who you're selling to and what you're selling. Yeah. All, all of those people are just at your fingertips. You've just got to know what to look for. Right. Um, And so that's what, really just ended up being my bread and butter was was sales navigator and understanding how to leverage that. And uh, so when I, you know, started researching my territory, the accounts in my territory, the people in my territory, um, I was committed to like, okay, I'm let me take a step back. Who are going to be in my sphere of influence when it comes to to purchasing our technology and the for the call center. Um and if you just want to start with going to, you know, your selected account and searching those keywords as simple as for me, it was call center. I'm just going to search call center. And then I'm going to, you know, dial it in a little bit more by selecting directors and VPs and, and C-level executives. And now when I start getting results, they're completely relevant to the industry, um, what they're doing on a day-to-day basis. And now when I call them, um, I know for a fact, like, you know, there's no question around like they're a director of the call center operation because I know it and I see it. Yeah. And one thing that, um, drives me crazy the you know, the worst question I think you can ask as a sales developer is, is calling them, they answer the phone and you mention their name. Um, and you say, yeah, I see, uh, that you're the director of call center operations over there. The ABC company, um, are you the best person to talk to about call center operations? Or um, maybe you didn't even mention their title. You're just saying, hey, I'm just wondering if you're the best person to talk about call center operations. Well, if you already know that and you've already done your due diligence in making sure, hey, I'm not adding anybody to my pipeline to begin with that I know isn't in that sphere, then why ask the question? Um and so I can go right into the relevance and, and why them. Um, I can I can say, hey, I'm reaching out because I noticed you were the director of call center operations over at ABC Company. And what we're doing for other collections companies, for example, is we're helping them increase revenue by doing ABC. I thought that would be something that would be relevant to you or maybe something you guys are already working on. Is that right? So I'm asking, you know, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm referring to their title. They already know I know who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm talking about how we're helping other companies in their industry. And, and I'm asking them, are they working on the same thing? Or are they working to improve? Everybody's working to improve, right? Um, just like you just said, you know, everybody's trying to rise in the ranks. And yep. uh, so you're asking relevant questions. So you're kind of guiding them. Um, in the direction you want them to go. And it doesn't mean that they're going to go in that direction every single time. But if you can start your conversation with all the relevant points, you're going to open that up for questions. And again, have a high quality conversation where you're learning yourself, because that's where it all starts. You're going to learn more from prospect calls than you will from, you know, your manager telling you about the call center industry. So, um, so yeah, that that's kind of my approach to just getting that conversation started with relevant prospects. Well, you used a few um, terms and, and words here that I really would love to just kind of marinate on for a, a moment. 
Um, what, what I heard in that process was really a demonstration of show me, you know, me to everyone that you're reaching out to, which again, on the buy side, I think is actually very under indexed upon because it's human nature that when, you know, interesting, interested is interesting. I think Dale Carnegie said that over a hundred years ago Yeah, and it's no less true today. Um, but that ability to show, show me, you know, me when you're talking to strangers, interrupting their day you know, ultimately like coming in from the clear blue sky with a brand that they may or may not be familiar with is so crucial to the sequencing of successful appointment setting and starting of sales conversations, isn't it? A thousand percent. Yeah, I think, uh, and I think at times we um, overcomplicate or think too much about the need for showing them, you know them, right? Uh, You know, I think at times we, we think, okay, if I need to show them, I know them, you know, I've got to go do research on all these social media platforms and somehow to drop that I, you know, we have this thing in, in common. And it's not that it could be, maybe it's obvious on LinkedIn. Maybe they say they're a huge football fan or, you know, they like dogs. Um, and somehow it comes up in conversation. But if you at least start with something that is so obvious, which is their title and the company they work for and the industry that they're in, that will guide you um, in the right direction. I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I come at it from a slightly different perspective, which is I think if you delve into the personal realm, um, you're actually reducing your probabilities because why are you calling in the first place? You're calling with the idea that you want to have a business discussion. And more importantly, you want a second discussion to follow the exactly. first. Exactly. AKA the beginning of a sales cycle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like the, the personal actually starts the conversation in a further off place than focusing in on title, role, department, KPIs, you know, goals that that individual might have relevant to your areas of promise as a business. Exactly. hundred percent. The other thing that I think is really interesting that you use the word of and and I don't think enough SDRs really kind of like hit and stick on this one is you use the word learn. What can I learn from any and every, you know, outreach outbound motion that I take um, as an SDR? I think, you know, selfishly like that learning is key to us doing our jobs better, isn't it? I thought, yeah, a hundred percent. I, I, I think that was, you know, I, I kind of touched on it, but I, when I started to find my stride as a sales developer, it was when my effort towards learning grew ex- exponentially. Like I was mm. just like, you know, I was diving into books and I was trying to figure out like, okay, not only like sales, because I think, it, uh, you know, you can read all the sales books in the world. Um, but like learning about discipline and and how can I be, you know, adopt this, Um, nature of discipline in my day-to-day processes and effort and uh, habit building, things like that. And so learning doesn't have to just be or or start with the company you work for or, or the software you sell. I think if you just have this effort in just learning in general about whatever it is that sparks your interest, I think you develop a skill of learning. And so it just naturally starts coming. And so then you, you start to learn more about your company. Um, You start learning about the prospects that you're selling into. Um, And so, yeah, I, a hundred percent, I think learning is uh, something that's, it's undervalued, but when put in the right place and uh, your commitment to it on a consistent basis, consistency is key. it will just come naturally. Um, you'll be able to learn and pick up new concepts quicker and your desire to do so, you know, will, will grow. Yeah. Learn how to learn. <laughs> exactly. No, it's, it's a real thing. <laughs> it, it's funny. One of the things that we over index on hard here at science when hiring SDRs net new is curiosity, largely mm-hmm. because it, it, it's the embodiment of, of exactly what you just said over the last you know minute and a half. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's 
and going back to myself, you know, I, I struggled as a, as a sales developer at first, and I can honestly say I wasn't the most curious individual. Um, I just wanted to figure it out. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I could just, yeah, in, impatient. That That's the perfect word. I just wanted to go do it. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, so yeah, when you can just slow yourself down and be curious, like, okay, this is what we do. This is the process. Why do we do that? Why, why does it need to be done that way? And a lot of the best sales developers that I've worked with ask that question a lot, you know, um, maybe too much, just kidding. Uh, you can't ask why too much, but it's, I think those individuals are the ones that, um, grow and are the most successful because they now understand, okay, that there really is a reason behind this, even though, you know, I just didn't think so, or I ignored it. Um, but now I understand, you know, I've got to put the lead in this status at this time because it affects all the reporting, you know? Right. So it's something as simple as that. Well, you know, it, it's funny too. Like, I think that what you're describing is slowing down to speed up. And I see it on a lot of successful SDRs trajectories. When, you know, the light bulb moment usually comes on when they start to make it less about them, less about themselves, and more about kind of like, as you said, the discipline, the habit, the process, the way in which you're going to approach anything, a conversation, an email, a LinkedIn outreach, whatever message I'm going to, you know, like, put in, I'm curious about some of your own healthy habits, you know, like, like one of mine for SDRs is always lead with the other, always be focused on, you know, prospects first before yep. you start to talk about yourself, your company, why we're awesome, why we're great, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, you know, if, if you, you know, I, for me, it started, I hate talking about like myself, my, me, me, me. <laughs> um, but when no, I started you're on to, stage for a reason to, to practice, <laughs> When I started to practice discipline, um, it it wasn't just in the day to day work as a sales developer. I'd actually say it started with, ironically, it started with running. So, mm. um, I you know some people love him, some people hate him, but I read David Goggins' book, uh, "Can't Hurt Me." That book for me, uh, I can genuinely say changed my life. Like I, I think. That was the, at the time of like a turning point um, from a performance perspective and my trajectory, that was the book I was in the middle of. So I started running um, because that's what he did. And um, I found this love for running. I don't run as much anymore and my knees hurt really bad, but I found this love for running. And, uh, and then I just like, that fault, like that followed me into the day-to-day process as a sales developer. And so it was like, and then we even ran competition, a competition at nice and contact that involved running. And I had just picked it up a few months before. And so then they were running this competition that, that involved Fitbits. And I was like, sucked. And I was like, oh man, I'm going to crush this and, and I'm going to win. And, uh, believe it or not, I did win that competition. And they flew me to Abu Dhabi and I, I attended the formula one grand prix race. Wow. It was amazing. But you know, I, as funny as it sounds, and some people might make fun of me or say like, that's some like woo woo weird stuff, but it was like this discipline that followed like optimism and that followed with, uh, like a genuine joy around just like. I love what I'm doing and I'm, and it's not just like about the work, but it's just like the daily habits that I'm starting to develop. And, uh, you know, whether that really played a part in me winning a, a, a draw of a hat competition, maybe not, maybe it did, but, uh, it, it made it that much sweeter. Um, so yes, I think once you start developing habits here and there, it, it starts translating into other processes and, and other aspects of your life. Well, and now you're, essentially the head of biz dev over at connects one, um, you know, relatively new into the role yep, and get to, new. did you inherit a team? Are you building from scratch? What's the, this, the story yeah. there? Yeah. So, you know, I actually came in thinking like there was going to, it was going to be a big lift. You know, I had just built a team, uh, at observe AI 
Um, and, and that was very much from scratch, um, hiring an outbound team, building process, all of that stuff. And um, coming in, I've actually been very impressed with what the global head of business development has put together. So he's based in the UK. That's where the company's headquartered. And he's got this incredible knowledge base of just information about what we do, call centers, um, our processes, which I thought I was going to have to work on, you know? So it's kind of like this, you know, sense of relief to be honest. Um, but, um, yeah, so I'm building a team from scratch here in Utah. Um, you know, it's, we're off to the races. Um, we've got a couple in the door, a couple more starting this coming week and, uh, we'll continue to grow over the next, uh, few months in the year. Um, and uh yeah it, it's great to be here uh great company great leaders um and there's this genuine effort of collaboration and just wanting everybody to to win which is uh exciting and and uh i i just love it so far how do you think through kind of like your first 90 days of what you want to put in place structurally yeah. <clears throat> you know, kind of the non-negotiables, especially when hiring that new yeah. um, or other things that you think are successful ingredients for building a sure. winning team that, you know, you'll be judged on six, nine, 12 yeah. months from now. Right. Right. You know, I, I mentioned it earlier, um, the leaders and, and the team that they built at nice and contact, um, they had an incredible framework and when followed um, consistently, uh, it, it's a recipe for success. Um, and so we have had, and, and I continue use them today, the core competencies of, of business development. And those are things like, you know, the pitch, how do you organize your pipeline? Um, your attitude even, which I, I literally just did that training with, uh, my new hires this week, um, email psychology, things like that, because, you know, it's not all about the process and being an SDR, but like there's these core competencies that um, directly affect and and are a huge part of sales development and sales. And so those are the things that I've brought with me since I've left Nice, and I've made some small tweaks here and there and made improvements based on you know the the market and the economy and and how can we improve and A/B test. Um, so those are big, those are things that I bring, um, when it comes to hiring, you know, I'm a big believer in like, you know, experienced individuals are great. Um, you know, they help me as a leader, they can be leaders themselves. Um, but I love hiring people that don't have the experience and come from, you know, unique backgrounds. So, you know, I love telling stories around you know, this, or I guess the success stories around hiring. And I don't at all take credit for this because this individual uh, very much had the mindset that I speak a lot about. And um, that was effort. I'm going to find a way, positivity. Um, and I'm just, you know, against all odds, I'm going to be successful. And this individual came from like a background of like working in food service uh you know being a server or waitress at uh, top golf and uh she came on and i'll never forget interviewing her we were in a panel interview with the other leaders and one of my favorite questions to ask is um what do you prefer is it discipline or is it motivation mm. and i'll never forget she kind of like t- took a step back and she goes well um, I actually don't believe in motivation. And at first I was like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but she came back and she said, I think if you have discipline, motivation is irrelevant because you've already developed this habit of, you know, this is the expectation. I'm going to do it. Um, her response was much better than what I'm I'm explaining, but it it threw me off to the point where I was like, you know, I've got to hire her. And I remember another leader even, even like sent out a message to the other leaders, like that was gold. And so I hired her, obviously she came in and she had the best attitude. Um, She was going to find a way to hit quota. 
And I remember her telling me like, Hey, this is my goal for month number two. And I was like, Hey, I, I love it. Let, let's make it happen. We'll see. And right she did. Yeah, she did it. And, uh, she continued to just crush it over the next year and a half or so. And, um, and she acted as a peer leader, even when she wasn't asked to, um, just because she developed this wealth of knowledge that she wanted to share. And um, she did it in a way that um, was respectful. And uh, so I think because of it, she she developed a, a sense of respect amongst her peers. And ultimately, when I left, she ended up replacing me in, in that short period of time. And that? so it's those people that have, you know, unconventional backgrounds that I love, even though not every single one's going to pan out and they don't all have come with that mindset or, or level of discipline or work ethic, but knowing that she managed to totally change her life, um, was amazing. Like it was amazing to watch and, uh, she's continuing to crush it today. Well, I don't know. It, it sounds like listening to a third hand that she had quite a bit of motivation, even if she said she didn't. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Very motivated, but she, you know, she had that instinct of, of, uh, I'm going to make this work. And, and yeah. she was extremely disciplined in her process. And, uh, there, there was, a uh, you know, no distractions, uh, policy of hers, I think where that uh, assisted her as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, you didn't use this word, but I, I hear a lot of grit in there too. Absolutely. So yeah, definitely. You mentioned part of your kind of like framework that I'm a little fascinated by and have been for a long time. And that's email psychology. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, you know, kind of like your beliefs there or the, the nice framework, um, yeah. belief, belief set around kind of the email channel. Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, the core, idea around emails has followed me but i think the structures have changed you know there's different opinions here and uh you know everybody's got the best idea and so i'm not here to tell you this is the the best approach uh, by any means but you know it all has to do with like really delivering a relevant message and um following that with a, a necessary or relevant call to action um a lot of people hate asking for or hate when people ask for meetings. Mm. Um, and so I think it, uh, adjusting that, and I've done this myself, adjusting it to, you know, uh, a call to rather than a call to action, a call to interest or like, Hey, you know, is this something you guys are working on? And just getting that response of some kind yep. is very valuable. And so, you know, the framework is very much, you know, get the, introductions out and start introducing them to who you are and and have the the conversation or i guess um discuss why am i reaching out make it relevant what we do how we're helping other companies and um that will develop in a way where you can just start getting a little more personalized and uh, I think the most important thing is just be human. And I think that can be yeah. difficult over an email. Um, whereas like I loved being on the phone, even though it, it was a cause for a lot of rejection and frustrated people just because of the nature of the job. Um, but if you can make yourself human uh, over an email, you'll find a lot of success. And so, and then, it, you know, tying in referrals or, Hey, I talked to this person. Um, those simple things like, and just sharing information that you already know about their company. Maybe you know that they use a competitor. If you're leveraging that in your messaging, you're proving your point and you're proving that, you know, I've I've done my due diligence. And I think prospects appreciate that because yes. too often we're just, you know, clicking send in sales loft and outreach. And uh, whatever is in that email may or may not click but there's a pretty dang good chance it's either not going to click or they're going to ignore it from the get go. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can, you know, say something of relevance in the beginning and uh, continue to follow up and uh, just catch their attention, catch their attention, whether it's subject line or that first initial introduction in the email, you'll, you, you can develop a, a solid relationship with that prospect. So where do you come down on kind of like, and, and I guess this is, an even more colorful opinion, 
given that you you came from an AI company and observe AI, where do you come down on use of AI tools, especially for email in sales? Yeah. You know, I, I think if you, I'm not an individual that is like, oh, let me go to chat GBT and figure out the best formula to build an email. Right. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, the type to go do that. Um, for me, I think the the most important thing you can do is similar to making phone calls and telling the prospect why you're reaching out to them, why their company, and and you know why now. What's the relevance? I think you need to be able to deliver that same message in an an email. And so if if you ChatGPT or AI can't do that for you, don't use it. Um, mm-hmm. But if you found a way or a formula to incorporate AI into that process, by all, may, by all means, maybe it's a, a time thing. Maybe it, it, it works faster than you do. So you're able to send out more and it's increased your productivity. But in turn, you know, it doesn't matter if you've increased the output. If you're not getting responses, that doesn't matter, right? Right. So as long as those emails are relevant, whether it's driven by AI or not, um, I think you should do what what's working for you. Boy, that's so true. I mean, I I always say that the the relevancy bar is if you don't cross that, you don't have anything. Like literally, you know, the email construct for buyers is you're battling the 121 other emails in their inbox that day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. And we scan emails in what, two and a half seconds or less? Yeah, maybe less. Cases, <laughs> less. Maybe less. <laughs> <laughs> Between meetings, on fire, yeah. go, 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 go. Exactly. Um, and yeah, that's the catch point, you know, that you have to essentially establish that why me, why now, why care? If you don't, there's either a delete or there's a just ignore, however that person handles their inbox. Right. Um, and yeah, the odds are definitely stacked against all of us. I uh, totally agree. Totally agree. So it's, yeah, it's all about, uh, and I think tracking those things, A-B testing, and I think most people are pretty good about this. And and so if you're doing that effectively um, and consistently, I think you'll, you'll find success. Um, it's just around that consistency piece. Yeah. The, the one fly in that ointment and not to get off on a ramp, but like A-B testing um, does fly in the face of true personalization when it comes to email. You know, and I oftentimes find that that's the show me, you know, me moment where <clears throat> I'll just say it. I think a lot of people in the buy side who have been prospected before, which is most lists all the time everywhere yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that are worth working anyways, um, they, they see, you know, kind of like a canned templated, you know, one size fits all this message went out to another hundred people just like me message. Mm-hmm. They can see that from a mile out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, uh, usually, you know, you've got your ideal, you know, customer profile and the personas you want to sell to. And, you know, really you could take any problem that you guys solve for and just plug it into your email. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of, you know, finding their pain today, you yes. know, and, and at times that's just, it's just a guessing game, right? We don't know. We don't know for sure. Maybe maybe you got lucky and they posted on LinkedIn. Like for me, it's like, man, I hate grading uh, calls, you know, for quality <laughs> assurance. They're they're not doing that, right? But um, if they did, gosh, it would be my lucky day. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, you've got to find the pain point. And you know, I think Lavender has a cool uh, approach around, you know, pick a, a pain point that you solve for, and continue to and mention that over what is it three emails or so yeah um and different ways you guys solve for that and rather than jumping from one pain point to the next to the next to the next because um you know that could maybe one of them will will stick um but if you understand your persona and the pains that they deal with you can be you can pick one of those pains that you know like gosh i know in this industry every call center leader is dealing with this pain. So yeah. I can get very granular and specific um, in my emails there. 
Truer words, Johnny, truer words. Um, <laughs> this has been a great interview. I, I really like kind of like the, the directions that we've gone. For any of our listeners who are potentially interested in carrying on that conversation, maybe even some of our listeners that, that want to apply for a job uh, sure. <laughs> as you're hiring, yeah. Um, where should they go to find you? Yeah. So, uh, on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm Johnny Salambini. Um, but Johnny spelled funny. So it's J O H N N I E. That's me. Um, uh, and I think that's probably when it comes to, you know, separating personal and, and professional, that's the best place to, to locate me. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm getting distracted in all different locations. So uh, I love networking and connecting. And, and like I said, I have a passion for helping people and, and uh, I love hearing from people that are in a tough position and, or maybe they're trying to get promoted, but they're having a hard time. You know, if you're in a similar boat, I'd, I'd love to, to help and, and give you some suggestions. And, uh, you know, maybe one day you'll, you'll be a leader yourself. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks again for joining us, Johnny. This was a great conversation. I love it. Thanks. Thanks.